From Swagman Media, this is the Jolly Swagman Podcast. Here are your hosts, Angus and Joe. Hello there, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to the Jolly Swagman Podcast. My name is Joe Walker, one of your co-hosts, and it has been some time. It's great to be back with you. I've been doing a deep, 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 deep dive into the Australian housing market. I'll be sharing some research with you on that very soon. And my co-host and friend, Angus Isles, is in the middle of a very exciting move from Australia to another country, and I'm sure we'll update you on that very soon. So it has been a while, but we have some excellent episodes to release and share with you. The first of those is this one right here. And my guest is Kevin Rudd, who was the Prime Minister of Australia from 2008 to 2010, and then again in 2013. He's most notable, perhaps, for leading Australia through the global financial crisis, as we call it down under, because thanks to a number of factors, including our floating currency, the Chinese demand for our resources, and the rapid and strong fiscal stimulus package introduced by the Australian government, both at the end of 2008 and the beginning of 2009, Australia almost uniquely avoided recession entirely. So we continued growing through the global recession. I asked Kevin about what it was like making the call to announce those stimulus packages, about the anxiety at the time in the highest levels of government, and I asked him especially about the first homeowner's boost, which was a particular piece of the stimulus package, which defibrillated the Australian housing market, but for which we might be paying for the consequences further down the track. We delve into philosophy and economics. We talk about the Gillard coup of 2010 when Rudd was overthrown as prime minister and whether he's forgiven Julia. And we also talk about China and whether he sees war between China and the US as inevitable. I hope you enjoyed this conversation as much as I did. So without much further ado, please enjoy this chat with Kevin Rudd. Kevin Rudd, thanks for joining me. Good to be with you. I'm just munching my uh, iced favo here. <laughs> no worries. You're welcome. <laughs> it's good. It's tasty and it's nutritious. <laughs> do you listen to many podcasts? I do. Yeah. Like in the United States where they're probably even more popular than they are here. But they're catering for a huge demand in the um, media marketplace. People are tired of trivia, a little tired of titillation. And they have a deep feeling in their guts that there's something going wrong with the world in our country. Mm. And they want to have a seasoned, detailed conversation about um, what those challenges are and, most critically, what can credibly be done about them in substance. So I'm, I'm really happy to meet you and speak with you today. I want to talk to you about the financial crisis, Australian politics and China uh, those are the three topics I want to touch on in the time that we have. But before we get started, I wanted to ask you about speech writing. Yeah. Um, so I did do a little bit of speech writing um, you poor for Andrew Lee while I was at ANU. <laughs> okay. And the first two guests we had on the podcast were Bob Lemon, who was Al Gore's speech writer, and Don Watson. All oh, right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Don was a great speech writer. He was. Yeah. I love his lyrical style. Hmm. I thought it was interesting. So a couple of days ago, Scott Morrison delivered a national apology for the victims of institutional sexual abuse. And I always think the thing that makes great speeches great is that they're about important things, first and foremost. But I'm always fascinated at the same time by the power of words to enhance the impact of a speech. And I feel like, I think you're a very instinctive orator. And although the sorry speech you gave to Indigenous Australians, especially the stolen generations, and the apology that Scott Morrison gave on Monday were both about important things. I just wanted to kind of highlight a subtle difference I saw in the uh, the use of rhetoric. So when Scott Morrison reached his crescendo, uh, he said, and again today we say sorry to the children we failed, sorry, to the parents whose trust was betrayed and who have struggled to pick up the pieces, sorry, to the whistleblowers who we did not listen to, sorry, and it carries on. In your speech, in your crescendo, you said, for the pain, suffering and hurt of these stolen generations, their descendants and for their families left behind, we say sorry. To the mothers and the fathers, the brothers and the sisters, for the breaking up of families and communities, we say sorry. And for the indignity and degradation thus inflicted on a proud people and a proud culture, we say sorry. 
I thought that was interesting because so both speeches use what's called epistrophe, which is the Latin terminology for repetition at the end of the sentence. But whereas Scott Morrison just uses the word sorry, you use we say sorry. And I really liked that because I thought that sorry in contrast to the suffering that you know authorities have inflicted on people feels a little bit inadequate. It's a bit like sorry. But also it adds a lovely cadence when you say we say sorry. And there's that sort of active verb, we say, like we're doing something to make reparations. And I wanted to ask you after that lengthy uh, introduction and recitation, whether you could tell us if you have a theory on speech writing, firstly, and secondly, any technical tips. Well, I think the first part of what you said is the most critical. That is for a speech to be worthwhile, it has to be about something that is real. Too much political speech making is about bullshit. <clears throat> uh, it's got to deal with uh, the real state of uh, challenge and opportunity. It has to deal with what you're going to do about those challenges or in seizing those opportunities. And then lifting people uh, emotionally or spiritually to that plane so that they can then engage. It is both a rational and a cerebral process, but it's also a spiritual and a poetic process as well. There's a reason for that. It's not manipulative. It's just that we're all built that way. We are both rational and emotional human beings simultaneously. Mm. Anyone who says we're one to the exclusion of the other is just nuts. I think the other thing I'd say about speech making or effective speech making is that it has to be credibly in your own voice. Uh, anyone who seeks to imitate the voice of someone else uh, will be spotted for a fraud at a thousand paces. Um, it's got to be your voice. And uh, what you, I think you see through the cadence of the apology, uh, people would, who have known me over many years would say, yep, that's him. Um, that's what he says, and that's how he says it. Uh, and it's therefore got to be naturally uh, in your style, which brings me to my final point. I've never really used speechwriters. I've had a few people who have done a bit at the sides of what I've done in public life. But anything that's important, like the apology, I write out by hand, mm -hmm. uh, or I type out with these two very bent index fingers on my iPad. Mm -hmm. um, because it's got to authentically be me and using what I think is the natural sense of, uh, of cadence and of rhythm and where necessary uh, rhyme and alliteration, um, which comes naturally to me. Mm. Uh, if you subcontract that, you lose part of your soul on the way through. I think you were still writing that speech, the sorry speech, the morning of the delivery, right? Yeah, yeah. It's... Um, uh, Albo came rolling into the office uh, for the apology, which was due at nine. We had a few things going wrong those days, including an attempted coup in East Timor. So I'd been distracted, apart from the fact I had writer's block for so long trying to write the apology. And I'd only really done it the previous weekend and still hadn't finished it as of that morning. <laughs> so Albo walked in and uh, expletive deletive, God, you leave these things late, mate. And I said, no, I was just trying to get the conclusion right. And this was at... 20 to 9 for a 9 o'clock start. <laughs> place was full. I've already welcomed all the Indigenous leaders into the, yeah. into the Parliament building by that stage. But it had to be right. And sometimes you sit down with a terrifyingly blank piece of paper and you just stare at it because nothing happens, known in the writing business as the dry times. <laughs> and I've had a few of those. Yeah. And then suddenly uh, it opens up. For me, the credible thing also about... And the critical thing about the apology was to sit down with Nana Fijo, someone who'd been a member of the Stolen Generations, and something which politicians really do, which is just shut up and just listen to somebody explain in their voice what happened to them. Because mm. part of speech making is to enter into the emotional world of somebody else, not just your own emotional world. So we're speaking... 10 years since the global financial crisis and 10 years... This and is known as a change of pace. 
10 years and one week, in fact, I think, to the date that you uh, announced the first $10.4 billion stimulus package. Mm. Uh, Weekend, I think, of the 14th and 15th of October, from that, memory. That's it, yeah. So Friday was the 10th, weekend 11th and 12th, and you announced it on the 14th, mm. which must have been the Tuesday then. Something like that, yeah. yeah. It was several layers of scar tissue ago. <laughs> I still exhibit the secular stigmata from that time. Did was, you grow up as a Catholic? I did, actually. I went to Catholic school. Mm-hmm. You know, it's stigmata, right? Those, <laughs> I do, we, those yeah. weeping wounds. Yeah, the weeping wounds. Yeah, I had the secular version of those. <laughs> <laughs> I was following a great Twitter account recently. It was live tweets in real time following the financial crisis um, mm. 10 years before. Wow. So I was following the collapse of Lehman Brothers in real time on the 15th of September and it was really interesting, kind of chilling. At the time, I mean, I was in year 11 at high school. It, I didn't quite grasp the significance of it, only now do I in hindsight. But I want to ask you what it was like, but let me ask a specific question to make it easier for you. We deal with complex questions too. <laughs> <laughs> so on October the 10th, this was the Friday, you were anticipating a run on the banks the following Monday. Yeah. And the key reason for that, or one of the key problems for Australia, was the refinancing of the Australian banks. Can you just just tell us what that means? Well, in the Australian banking market... The reality is that the uh, rolling liquidity of our banks depends in large part on a series of interbank lending arrangements with um, uh, other Australian banks, but predominantly international banks. And so the problem that we faced was that the normal operations of the financial market, which was banks lending to each other to cover liquidity in the markets, was suddenly being interrupted, in particular from offshore. And there's a reason for that, and that is once the international banks, those in New York primarily but elsewhere, feared um, uh, the state of their own balance sheets in the light of the unfolding financial crisis in the United States and questions being asked about uh, mortgage-backed securities, Those guys in the United States look after themselves first. They repair their own balance sheets or they defend them. That means that the normal lines of credit they extend to the rest of the banking system are least of all those abroad and least of all of those in Australia uh, become the first casualties. As a result, the lines of international credit began rapidly to dry up. And of course, then you're in strife. You have a serious um, emerging banking crisis, which is why we had to look immediately at providing sovereign guarantees to say to markets, we, the sovereign, that is the Commonwealth of Australia, stand behind the uh, normal operations of Bank X, Westpac, um, seeking its international lines of credit from the major banks of New York. It worked. Mm. But it was a near-run thing, as Wellington said after Waterloo. <laughs> <laughs> the plumbing of the banking system is very esoteric. I mean, not many people understand that banks actually share liquidity with each other domestically, mm. but also they, they need to borrow money from mm. usually from the US. Yeah. Mm. It's true. It's a complex market and most of us, um, um, for most of it, it's invisible mm. because it's just how markets operate. And normally they function perfectly well. But I'd begun having these conversations with Ken Henry, the then Secretary of the Treasury, quite some months before about worst-case scenario planning, both for the banks, for our ultimate balance of payments in Australia, and beyond that, uh, the implications of any uh, genuine global financial crisis. So we had, uh, as a government, worked up a number of contingency plans. Mm. And as of about the middle of this year, Uh, We're talking about 2008. Uh, We had developed uh, a memorandum for uh, 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 addressing the challenges of Australian financial uh, institutions with distressed assets. I think that was the euphemism we used for it at the time. (laughs) Uh, And so we had a fair bit of the policy preparatory work done. Many other Economies and financial systems around the world were just caught with their trousers down. Mm. 
You were a very financially literate Prime Minister for someone who never had a formal education in economics or finance. But I suppose Paul Keating's a good example of, of not needing that. But I remember you, you were quizzing Ken Henry from when you first took office about things like the capital account and the current account and what the likely scenarios were for Australia. What do those things mean? Why were they important? Well, what I was seeking to explore with Ken at the time was a worst case scenario uh, planning, which has given our country has historically been uh, a capital importer because we've run a series of uh, current account deficits over a long period of time. <clears throat> Uh, we import a lot of uh, – we've traditionally run trade deficits where they have to be financed from somewhere, usually on the basis of us being a net importer of capital through foreign investment into the Australian economy. And that as a result, all these things then ultimately balance out, except that if the cash ceases to flow, <laughs> uh, then you have a problem at mill. Uh, we had a problem at mill. So what I was seeking to explore with Ken – as of about February of 2008, is what happens if the uh, normal operation of these capital markets stops or slows, um, which goes to a question of, well, to what extent do we have sufficient uh, reserves to handle that kind of crisis? Answer, uh, limited. If you look at the actual state of Australia's foreign reserves, um, and then, therefore, what happens after that? Well, if you can't ultimately meet your payments uh, to the rest of the international economy, you have what's classically described as a balance of payments crisis. We've seen that unfold in other economies around the world and not all of them developing economies. It happened to the British in the 1970s. Uh, then you have interventions by the international financial institutions like the IMF. Of course, if you have a simultaneous crisis for facing all financial systems around the world, uh, that's plainly beyond the capacity of the IMF to deal with. So we had to think through our worst-case scenario planning for what we would do. Uh, had the sovereign guarantees that I signed off on on that fateful uh, weekend in November not worked, uh, then I would have been uh, held accountable in history uh, as uh, the Prime Minister who signed off literally a trillion dollars plus worth of financial guarantees to a bunch of private banks only to see it all blow up. It's a very focusing moment when you do that. <laughs> what was the feeling like in the room at the time? It was uh, one of deep anxiety uh, because we knew what we were facing. Uh, it was one of uh, analytical clarity because uh, I wanted us above all to spend time getting the analysis right, both of what was happening in financial markets on day one of that critical weekend when we took the decisions on the guarantees both for interbank lending but equally critically for everyone's savings deposits as well. Combined guarantees worth a cool two and a half trillion. Mm. Signed, Kevin Rudd, graduate Nambour High School. <laughs> um, uh, by the way, year 12 economics. <laughs> um, Did you have any hesitation about doing it? No, because mm. uh, there's never anything perfect in public policy. Usually it's the question of which is the least bad of these options or on balance, which is uh, the better of several options put before you. But intellectually, we've been working to this point for some time in the midst of everything else you happen to be doing in government at, at, uh, at this time. So it was the right course of action, but it still, it ultimately hangs on me. I'm the Prime Minister, so, you know, take out your, um, uh, your, uh, your fountain pen and sign on the bottom line, which is what I did. But it worked. and We had no run on the Australian banks. No one lost their savings deposits. Uh, our banks uh, did all their interbank lending for the subsequent, I think, three months using the guarantee that we provided. And then by the time we got to month four, month five, it was partially used. By about six months out, markets had begun to stabilise, particularly after the March 2009 London summit of the G20. Mm. Hairy months. Mm, indeed. And the, so the Australian economy only contracted by well, – the negative growth was only 0.1% in that December quarter, the end of 2008. Uh, so a, That really pissed me off. A mild technical <laughs> recession, but it sort of marred your scorecard. <laughs> so, yeah. No, it was one, one quarter. <laughs> and even past the technical definition of a recession because it was a single right. quarter. It's very cheeky of the economy. Um, <laughs> and I, I sort of want to fast forward now to that summer of 08-09 when you penned the – 
the famous monthly essay. Hmm. I was rereading it again last week and I was thinking to myself how deeply charismatic it is for a political leader to pen a 10,000-word essay because it, what it sort of says is here's my thinking on this issue in its completeness and hmm. entirety and here's every step of reasoning in my hmm. argument and it's there for all to to see and I'm, I'm not hiding. You know, there's no, hmm. there's no sort of 280-character tweets or anything like that. Um, there was a really interesting point in the essay, which I just want to ask you about in particular, which was your discussion of the efficient markets hypothesis. Mm. And what it's... Catalexy. Yeah. <laughs> and what its implication... Hayek and madness. You That's mean. right, yeah. <laughs> that term was perhaps not coined, but made famous by Eugene Farmer from the University of Chicago in a, a famous paper in 1969 called Efficient Capital Markets, a review. Mm. And what does the hypothesis say in brief? Ultimately, that these things uh, return to equilibrium. And if you look at uh, the intellectual pedigree of this uh, school of financial economics, um, it does proceed from Hayek uh, through the Chicago School mm -hmm. uh, and uh, through efficient markets hypothesis, as you've just described. But it pays no account whatsoever to what Keynes at an earlier stage had correctly identified as the animal spirits. Uh, and anyone who thinks that uh, markets uh, under these sorts of circumstances act as uh, perfect rational barometers of rational self-interest has got rocks in their head or they're smoking something. Mm. Um, so uh, I came to that conclusion about efficient markets uh, uh, theory uh, as someone who intrinsically believes in markets, I'm a disciple of Adam Smith, both volumes, Theory of um, Moral Sentiments plus The Wealth of Nations and Smith's Elegant Theory of Price, which frankly is the, the revolution in modern economics over the last 200 years. But Smith would describe himself and has been described legitimately since as a, as a, uh, as a political economist um, he would see himself actually as a moral theologian at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and the bottom line is it ain't purely a function of markets. There is a role for the public good in the regulation of markets. But Hayek, who was Keynes's great rival, uh, basically in the economic theoretical debates of most of the um, uh, first half of the 20th century, uh, because of his own experiences in Eastern Europe and uh, road to serfdom and everything else, was had such an instinctive emotional reaction against any control by the state uh, that it pushed him in the reverse direction. And if you go to the um, uh, reductio ad absurdum infinitum of, uh, of uh, Hayek's thesis and you ask, well, why does this ultimately work? And he's reduced to this... Um, the primitive argument uh, of uh, this ancient game of chance uh, deployed, I think, by the ancient Greeks uh, called catalexy. Um, and that formed his crucible of logical argument in defence of efficient markets, well, his concept of efficient, unregulated markets. Uh, I think that ultimately it rested, therefore, on a form of his own primitive deism, <laughs> that there was, there was uh, some ultimate, ultimate invisible hand holding all this together, uh, whereas Smith, I think, had a much more sober view of where markets were located within the wider responsibilities of society and the state. As Joseph Stiglitz said, the reason the invisible hand seems invisible is because it's not really there. <laughs> well, I love Joe's comment on that score. It's a, it's a great... Uh, it's a great line. I think yeah. I, I've also quoted it in uh, perhaps that piece in the monthly. No, you did. By the way, the piece in the monthly in, enraged uh, the Murdoch boys. No, uh, yeah. I'm because it was a direct ideological s yeah. assault on the Hayekian view of the state and the economy, mm -hmm. which was a good state was a dead state and a great economy is one where markets could proceed unfettered, screw the workers and screw everybody else. Well, it was a very tribal essay in one sense, but it was also quite compelling and... Well, it was intellectually tribal. I mean, it wasn't. That's um, right. yeah. It wasn't uh, me saying boo hiss to the Australian banks mm. or anything like that. Through a royal commission process, it was saying markets operate for a purpose, which is to serve uh, society uh, and the polity. Mm. 
that uh, markets are not uh, moral endpoints in themselves. Mm. And that's the profound delineating point between those of us who describe ourselves as social democrats who believe in markets and those who are neoliberals who regard uh, markets with some form of uh, what I describe as mindless idolatry. Mm. But without even putting to one side the question of morality for a moment and focusing just on the, the efficient markets hypothesis, there's a question as to whether markets are truly efficient. And Robert Schiller, who famously won the, from Yale, who won the Nobel Prize jointly with um, Eugene Farmer and another guy in 2013, says that it's somewhat of a half-truth. Um, whereas Eugene Farmer, who's a great debater, is very strict about it and says that they're not you know, perfectly efficient, but most of the time they're really, really good and they prices incorporate all available information. And therefore, he says, that means that there's no such thing as a bubble. And everything that we identify as a bubble is really just ex post rationalization. Um, you know, in the total set of prognosticators, there'll be some people who predict a bubble. And if after the fact you elevate those people and say, look how smart they were, you're probably just being fooled by randomness, so to speak. And Farmer would say that not only that, but what part is the bubble, given that prices always typically rise after the fall? Is the bubble the up? Is it the down? Both? Neither? And he says, therefore, governments shouldn't get involved. Um, they shouldn't lean against the wind um, and prevent bubbles in asset prices. Worked well in the 30s, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. Rob, so <laughs> on, the, on the other hand, you have Robert Schiller and, and you know, someone like Richard Thaler, for example, who says that you know, maybe there's something to this. Maybe these bubbles do form. And there was a word you used in your essay, which I really liked, which was the word probable. And you said that the efficient markets hypothesis excludes the possibility of, or the idea of probable bubbles. Because that's the thing, you can never say with certainty that something's a bubble. It's always a probabilistic question. The other thing that I think... I think there's another element to that, though, as yeah, well, which sure. is efficient markets uh, hypothesis depends on the transparency of price-related information. And when you were looking at the size of financial markets relative to, uh, let's call them uh, goods markets mm. um, and markets in general... Uh, the sheer complexity of contemporary financial markets and the invisibility of um, ultimately who owns, owes what to whom and by when uh, creates an inherent uh, impediment to the full operation of markets in the pricing of risk. Go to the question of mortgage-backed securities and for what was then an unregulated derivatives market – Frankly, how could you make an intelligent punt in those market circumstances about a particular financial product when you didn't know or had no capacity to know where the ultimate liability within the financial system lay? Mm. So when you have a financial product or a set of products which actually can't answer the question, how much, owed by whom, by when, we have a problem. That's why we had an enormous financial asset bubble at the time. And as a consequence, uh, it uh, escalated to crisis. Mm. And as for the reverse, the second half of the argument was well, once it implodes, well, we just all stand around and wait for it mystically, magically, through the hand of Zeus uh, to reconstitute itself as once again an efficient uh, operating market. Mm. That's such a uh, – that involves a level of uh, religious belief in uh, how these things actually work in practice, which I think defies any – element of rationality, empiricism, let alone what you and I would describe as common sense. That's where the state must step in, uh, either as the guarantor of last resort, the re-regulator of the markets. I note for the empirical record, it was only after the social democratic state, led by me at the time, intervened in October of 15, that we had stability in markets in Australia or something beginning to approach it. And only after the collective states of the G20 intervened in March of 2009 <clears throat> with a five trillion plus a global stimulus package and coordinated action by the monetary policy authorities of the largest economies in the world that private capital markets said, well, thank God um, they're in control. Mm. Um, I think 
these are worthy of some empirical reflection. Uh, and so for those who argue that in perfect uh, efficient markets hypothesis that these were outrageous interventions uh, in marketplaces which only made things worse, I mean, that involves a level of religious fundamentalism which would send your average Southern Baptist into retirement school. <laughs> I, want to make, I want to make this point to you before we move on. So the other flaw, I think, in, in Farmer's reasoning about bubbles is that he extrapolates from stock prices to house prices. And I think housing markets are actually a very different species. Mm. And what I'd say is that housing markets aren't well modelled as efficient markets. They're better modelled as information cascades. Mm. And this is a point that Schiller and a number of other economists have made. And the reason is threefold. Firstly, because of the large transaction costs, you don't have the instantaneous revelation of information that you do in stock markets. There's not as much liquidity. Secondly, there's no ability to convey negative information because you can't short sell houses. And thirdly, there's a prevalence of amateur investors mm. in housing, which you don't see to the same scale in stock markets. Mm. Um, so housing bubbles can happen probabilistically, to, to use your word, a probable bubble. And I wondered if you have any thoughts on the Australian housing market at the moment, because my deep concern is that we're in the mother of all bubbles. Hmm. Well, traditionally the tools of public policy in this country have disproportionately uh, favoured one particular asset class for investment, and that's uh, real estate. Um, and most notoriously reflected in what we do in terms of the negative gearing regime. Um, if you compare the Australian uh, real estate and housing market to most other advanced economies, you see a massive differential uh, in terms of uh, where people locate, lodge, invest most of their personal wealth. And ultimately that rests on a series of public policy instruments uh, which have made this advantageous. It's partly the emotional psychology of um, every Australian's right to own their own home. Got that, tick. Wastefulness of rent, more open economic argument, open-ended economic argument. Um, but thirdly, oh, by the way, if you have um, stacks of these properties, um, then it's the best way for you to earn a quid long time, as opposed to taking that investable capital and putting it behind another form of productive business investment or economic activity. So you're right to observe that we have a almost unique distortion in the Australian economy because of this. And most foreign visitors to this country or analysts of our economy often scratch their head about what the hell we're doing. As to whether we now have an uncontrollable uh, housing asset bubble, um, that's not my field of analysis. I don't wish to make prognostications about that in Australia in the current context. But I think some of the reforms currently being contemplated by the Australian Labor Party in terms of the future um, of uh, negative gearing, etc., I think these are wise in the long term mm. uh, to begin to... Uh, as it were, create a more normal economy, one less prone to a particular uh, asset class inflation. Then there's the broader question, just the efficient allocation of investment capital. Like it's all fine and dandy for people to own, you know, seven investment properties. Well, that's great. Tick. But why should we, uh, as Australians with available capital, simply assume that's the only way to make a quid? Uh there's something about our culture which sends most of our capital in that direction as opposed to putting a slice of it into venture capital, putting a slice of it into getting behind a, a good business idea which Ted and Fred down the back uh, have come up with with a new outboard motor engine or whatever it is. Um, I think there is a job of economic policy and social and cultural policy in this country to shake us out of the great Australian default position. I've got a hundred grand in my back pocket. What do I do with it? I know. I'll take out another um, loan on a house and uh, and salt it away in uh, in uh, uh, the outer suburbs of Melbourne. Mm. Uh, uniquely among most advanced economies, we have a tradition of auctions. And foreigners who come here find it bizarre, almost distasteful. Um, and I think auctions drive that mimetic desire. Mm. But houses are very tangible. It's a very honest signal of your net worth. 
the topics of barbecue conversation, as you said, we have such a high rate of home ownership. Um, and there's something very mimetic about housing. But also there are people who bill housing as the ticket to a better life. Hmm. Um, I was at a conference last weekend in Sydney, the real estate millionaires next door, um, just observing. Um, but it's a meme in Australia. And it's sad because 65% of the loan books of the big four are residential mortgages. Hmm. Well, it induces a level of uh, lethargy on the part of the uh, major Australian banks, as you know, uh, mm. where you're going to put your, um, let's call it your creative uh, entrepreneurial spirit, I know, behind the residential mortgage market because it's safe, mm. it's secure. Unproductive capital. Well, that would be my argument in aggregate terms. And more broadly across the Australian economy, uh when uh, I came to office in 2007, uh, one of our key pillars was how do we broaden the base of the Australian economy? You look, therefore, at the then comparative and competitive strengths and natural advantages of Australia, courtesy of previous public policy interventions, namely PJK, Keating. We had this, uh, at that stage, $1.5 to $2 trillion uh, superannuation industry. Of course, it had grown up a whole bunch of funds within Australia uh, who were happily living off the fat of the land, uh, courtesy of PJK's public policy intervention, dead hand of the state again, um, for which we all remain eternally grateful because it's one of the great uh, elements in terms of our ultimate balance of payments. You've yeah. got this, um, this huge national nest egg. Mm. But then the funds management industry, by that stage, 10 years ago, was the fourth largest in the world because of what we had done. And so I did ask for some numbers to be done. Well, how much of these uh, services are being exported to the rest of the world, given we've got such a bucket of talent and ability here? Answer, two-fifths of bugger all. Uh, why? Because they're all very happy uh, just being here. And then secondly, we had a withholding tax uh, at that stage running at 30%, uh, com uh, as opposed to that which applied to the funds management industry in Singapore of only 75 So I said, OK, guys. Is this the answer? I said, yep. I said, okay. So the tax is coming down from 30 to 15 and a half, to 15, then to seven and a half. And we did it across two budgets. The dial barely moved in terms of uh, what these guys then did to take their uh, inherent set of comparative strengths as funds managers within the Australian industry to become the funds managers for the pension funds of East Asia over the last decade. They sat on their fat derriere and did virtually nothing. It's a further illustration that um, there is too much complacency associated with uh, Australians being uh, comfortable with asset classes which have yielded a reasonable return over time, aided by public policy in the case of housing and real estate. Mm -hmm. But in their case... Um, not becoming creative, innovative, entrepreneurial, mm. taking the critical mass that we'd, that PJK had um, established for the Australian um, uh, superannuation industry and becoming, in fact, the superannuation industry leaders of the world and in the effective running of pension funds around the world. We haven't done that. Mm. And despite the tax advantages I brought in to make them competitive with the rest of the region, they sat on their dig because it was all too comfy and cosy. Your senior economic advisor during your first term as Prime Minister, Andrew Charlton, wrote a book before he started working for you called Ozonomics. But in the book, he made a very good point, which is that governments receive either the blame or the praise for what happens in the economy during their term of office. And sometimes that f that's fair, but sometimes it's not because they don't necessarily have control over economic events um, and nor do they necessarily cause them. Um, it's fair to say that if we'd gone into a deep recession while you were prime minister, you probably would have copped some political flack for that, um, but you managed to prevent it. I wonder whether you, you've considered the so the first home buyer's boost, which was part of the first $10.4 billion stimulus package. So uh, you guys increased the, the grants for purchases of existing homes from seven to $14,000 and new homes from seven to 
21,000 or something like that. It was 14, 14 and 21,000. House prices were coming down, but... It, you can blame me for all of that. <laughs> These were my decisions. That, yeah. So, so what was the genesis of the first home buyer's boost? Well, in our analysis in that fateful weekend in October of yeah. um, A, financial system stabilisation, and then B, the real economy and, uh, and the maintenance of growth and employment, in the B part of the conversation, which was the maintenance of employment and growth, we had to um, look at all the drivers of final demand. And so my discussion with the Treasury that weekend together with the colleagues was, okay, let's look at consumption, 60% plus of, uh, of uh, final demand. What can we do there? Answer cash payments. Uh, big uh, injection, 10 billion plus, about 1% of GDP before Christmas. Uh, political objective, policy objective, economic objective, cause employers to think twice about sacking their staff in retail before Christmas and to leave it instead until February to see whether the economy came back because the retail had people sacked right around the world in other economies leading through to Christmas. But then it was the other drivers of total final demand as well. Uh, it was what could we do in terms of private fixed capital investment. So we brought in the temporary investment allowance, uh, timely, targeted and temporary. Uh, the three T's. The three T's. Uh, we also looked at, uh, and private fixed capital investment, correct me if I'm wrong, is about 20% plus of um, final demand in the economy. Uh, then you look at, obviously, public investment, and, of course, we were we had other measures planned for that, which we were getting ready, including the school modernisation program. But then if you look at uh, the uh, slice of the economy represented by private residential construction, it's about 6 or 7%. And so you can't sneeze at that, and it was collapsing in a, in a heap. Mm. And that was of itself en- enable- enough to take us <laughs> screaming into recession if it right. went to zero. So what you needed was a huge psychological hit uh, in order to say to people, hang on, we could actually do something at this time. And so um, on the doubling of the uh, first homeowners uh, scheme from 7 to 14 for existing uh, residential uh, real estate, uh, yep, that was my decision. But the particular decision I own with pride was the trebling of the investment <laughs> allowance for uh, all yeah. the uh, for new home sure. owners. Why? If, if you look at the subsequent quarters of performance in that sector alone, it still came down. It was still uh, bumping along the bottom, but didn't crash. Mm. And I think we had a lot to do with that. And it certainly helped our aggregate performance stay north of zero. Mm. But I wonder whether, I mean, it would have been a hard decision not to implement the first home buyer's boost. Ken Henry was, if we fell into recession, Ken Henry was forecasting unemployment of, you know, 8%. Uh, or and, more. Or more, yeah. And, and remember a- the rest of the OECD was in double figures. Mm. And by the way, historically, when the world has had recession before, Australia ended up with a deeper recession and higher levels of unemployment than the rest of the developed world. Sure. That was the picture of the 80s and 90s. Mm. And there's a terrible human cost associated with that, obviously. But I wonder whether it might have been hard to let the housing market slip at that time, but whether we've just sort of taken the hair of the dog strategy and continued the bender. Because on a number of metrics, Australia right now screams debt deflationary recession to me. We've got a current account deficit that is about 3% of GDP. Asset prices have risen rapidly until the last quarter of last year. GDP growth sort of slowed, although it did uptick slightly in the last quarter. And our private debt to GDP ratio is around 200%. We've got the second highest household debt to GDP ratio in the world after Switzerland. We have the very dubious honour of winning silver in those Olympics. So, do I mean, do, do you, are you as concerned about this as I am? The next yes, few years? Yes, I am. I am concerned about the future, but on specifically on the first home owners boost. Hmm. When I said timely, targeted, and temporary, in our case, they were temporary. Mm. It ended on the 31st of December 2009. And we got rid of them. Yeah. And so our job was simply to plug collapsing uh, final demand because we'd read our Keynes, we'd read our general theory, and we saw what needed to be done in the midst of a existential financial and economic crisis. Um, but the Australian debt binge has a real problem associated with it, both corporate, private, private, 
uh, and um, uh, were it not, for example, for the mandatory savings culture which Paul Keating engineered uh, through the uh, compulsory superannuation, that we would be in a significantly worse position than we are. Uh, but yes, uh, there is a problem with debt finance consumption. It's a problem in many countries and cultures around the world. And it's a it's a continuing challenge for policymakers. Mm. I've just got a, I'm, I want to totally shift gears now, and I've just got a few more quick questions on those other topics. So politics, firstly. Have you forgiven Julia for the coup of 2010? Yeah, I'm quite explicit about that in the book. Um, and there's a reason for it. You just end up bitter and twisted if mm. you don't. And, and I don't intend to end up bitter and twisted. <laughs> but there's a difference between forgiving and forgetting. I haven't forgotten. That's why the book is there as a uh, historical record and of a uh, narrative of what occurred, factually based in 1,400 footnotes. Uh, Julia's book, I think, had uh, 79 footnotes in total. Uh, as I've sought to construct the historical account of what happened with the coup and subsequent to the coup. Define forgiveness. It means uh, not carrying within your um, guts and in your soul um, not just a sense of bitterness but a desire for retribution and revenge. Uh, I'm not into that business at all. Never have been, never will be. It just ultimately suffocates you as a human being. Mm. There's something about that definition. Read your Shakespeare, that's what happens. <laughs> There's something about that definition which is in a sense sort of neutral and I sometimes, I know this is a very high standard, but look to Mandela for a more positive version of forgiveness because what he did was, you know, despite being forced into prison for 27 years by the Afrikaners, he actually took active steps after he was released to embrace that community, so mm. reaching out, the reconciliation. Why not that model of forgiveness as opposed to just not well, harbouring Well, hang on, I say at the end of this book uh, and uh, leaving open the opportunity of uh, Julia and I working together in the international field in the future. Uh, Bill Shorten was um, uh, a member of the group which sought to um, bring about the coup in June of 2010. Uh, and uh, I've been out there supporting uh, Bill and the team's efforts to form the next government of Australia, notwithstanding what's happened to me personally. I said the same at my, the launch of this book of mine recently in Parliament House in Canberra. So in terms of uh, embracing what I describe as the future of progressive politics, uh, I think there are some runs on the board there, my friend, in terms of not just what I've done, but what I've indicated I'm prepared to do in the future as well. But, you know, you've still got to establish the historical record. And we shouldn't uh, uh, resile from that. Even former prime ministers deserve a right of reply. Um, when you've had uh, works of fiction produced by a combination of uh, Julia, Wayne Swan and others, um, which uh, have sought to elevate naked ambition into some higher political purpose in terms of the events of the coup of June 20, and some of us will have a different account of that period. Mine's there, it's in black and white. People will form their own judgment. Last question while I've got you here. So there's a book by Graham Allison, which I'm sure you've read or at least heard of, called uh, Destined for War? Question mark. And he talks about the Thucydides trap um, and that in the last 500 years, in 12 of 16 cases where a rising power threatened to displace an existing military power, it ended in war. Um, I want to ask you, firstly, why do you think that statistic exists? Why does war end? become almost inevitable, as Thucydides said, of, of Sparta and Athens? And secondly, what can the US and China do to make sure they don't fall into the same trap? Well, when I left Australian politics, I went to Harvard, to the Kennedy School, and I worked with Graham for a year. Um, and uh, we spent a lot of time talking about what became his book, uh, Destined for War. Uh, and uh, you'll see me mentioned in quite a few dispatches at the back of that book because oh, great. Uh, we uh, did a lot of work on it together. But it's his own idea. Mm. Um, uh, part of the academic critique of Graham is that how do you know there are 16 case studies worthy of study from 1500 to the present and have you skewed the historical example? Yeah. And that's part of the critique, for example, delivered against uh, Graham by Joe Nye, his friend and colleague from Harvard just across the Kennedy School quad. 
But there is an elementary logic to the proposition, looking at the history of the Peloponnesian Wars, 5th century BC, which has uh, resurfaced many times in history. Applied to China, I think it's a bit like this. In the last 12 months alone, what I've observed in the United States, where I now live and work and run an American think tank focused in part on US-China relations, the Chinese uh, economy and military capability for the first time have been identified in the United States as having achieved a critical mass which for the first time challenges uh, United States global dominance. And the United States in the year 2018 began responding to it. The official proclamation in Washington being we've moved from strategic engagement now to official strategic competition with China. What the slippery slope is between competition to confrontation to containment to cold war to conflict and to real war is, I'm not sure. But the lesson of Thucydides, uh, I believe, is that we still have, as the political theorists would remind us, and the international relations theorists, some of them at least, would suggest human agency. We can make a difference. So if you look at an address I delivered uh, to the US Naval Academy recently uh, at Annapolis and then published in Foreign Affairs magazine, there is therefore a concerted search by many of us for the third way through this, uh, not in search of either... Chinese capitulation or confrontation with China, but a way in which you can accommodate this rising phenomenon within the existing global order and do so uh, peacefully. Uh, it remains to be seen whether that's possible, but I worry about uh, the language we use about this uh, relationship now, which suggests that we're on a one-way track to hell. What odds do you give? I'm not into the odds-giving business. Uh, you know, I was brought up as a conservative Catholic like you, so we weren't allowed to bet. So basically, it's even money. <laughs> Kevin Rudd, thanks for joining me. Good to be with you. Cheers. Thanks very much for listening, guys. For links to everything discussed in that episode, and there was a lot, you can head to our website, thejollyswagman.com. That's man, M-E-N. And I will be back next week or the week after with another episode as promised until then thank you for being back with us if you enjoyed this please tell your friends about it and i'll speak with you very soon ciao